taking a look at some of the other protest movements, other um, societal change movements of the early 1960s, uh, you have the student movement. Um, in the early 1960s, colleges and universities tended to assume a type of parental responsibility for students attending school and had rather strict restrictions on what they could and could not do. At the University of California at Berkeley, Mario Savio, who had worked in the South during the Civil Rights Movement, wanted to set up a table to pass out leaflets um, in the quad, but the administration would not allow him because it was not directly related to a course. In December of 1964, he then began to demand that students be allowed to exercise their First Amendment rights to freedom of speech. He and several dozen others eventually took over the administration building at Berkeley where they staged a sit-in and soon other students joined in, holding on to that administration building for three days. His protest at Berkeley would be the first example of large-scale student protests, initially focusing on free speech, but then eventually expanding to address more issues that appealed directly to college students, such as more freedom in selecting their own classes and determining their own schedules, the rules for political activity, and even the rules for uh, social structures with on within campus, such as um, overnight guests in dorms and even the permission of alcohol for students who were of legal age. Now it is important to remember that at this point in history, the voting age was 21, not 18. That does not get lowered until the passage of the 26th Amendment in the early 1970s. Because of this connection of college students to free speech and the exercise of constitutional rights, college campuses would become a center of political debate during the 1960s. Another cultural movement you have at the same time is the women's liberation movement or the women's rights movement. Betty Friedan published her book, The Feminine Mystique, which pointed out that the average woman at the time received just 39 cents for every dollar that a man got in earnings. And she pointed out that not a single Fortune 500 company even had a single female executive. She also pointed out the existence of laws that prohibited abortion, which caused as many as 600 deaths to women each year. She also labeled what she called a good old boy network when it came to hiring and promoting workers and hoped to achieve better opportunities for women. The goals of the women's liberation movement would be encouraged by the establishment of the National Organization of Women, or NOW, which was formed in 1967. Besides better career opportunities, they sought equal pay for equal work, legalized abortion, paid maternity leave, sought to pass an Equal Rights Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, something that had been initially suggested way back in the 1920s. Though Congress did pass it and it submitted to the states for ratification, the ERA failed by just one state, requiring 38 states to become a part of the Constitution and only having the support of 37. One of the biggest reasons against the ERA was the issue of the draft, because the question was, could you have a draft for men only with the ERA being the law of the land? What is seen as one of the biggest victories of the women's rights movement was the Supreme Court decision of Roe v. Wade. The court ruled 7-2 to two that a right to privacy under the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment did extend to a woman's decision to have an abortion. In disallowing many state and federal restrictions on the issue, Roe v. Wade prompted a national debate that continues today about issues such as including whether and to what extent, extent abortion should be legal at all, who should decide the legality of abortion, and what the role should be of religious and moral views in the political sphere.
Roe v. Wade eventually reshaped national politics, dividing much of the United States into both pro-choice and pro-life groups, and activating grassroots movement on the own, both sides. These, of course, were not the only challenge to societal norms in the 1960s, because the 1960s was also a time of the hippies, the counterculture. The term hippie was originated by beatniks in the late 1950s, who felt that the world was divided into those who were hip and those who were square. The hippies of the 1960s represented the ideas of anti-materialism, anti-conformity. They questioned old values and authority figures, embracing what JFK had said in terms of getting up and getting involved. They rejected archaic attitudes. They rejected old guidelines and wanted to set up a new world with new moral guidelines and new rules, effectively establishing a counterculture versus the establishment. Hippies tended to borrow the basic idea of beatnik philosophy to try and live as simply as cheaply as possible because they considered money to be the root of evil. They were also highly active in social events such as the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the women's liberation movement. They were often called flower children as they wore their hair long partly because of the influence of the beetle and partly because that was seen as a symbol of protest. It was anti-conformity. They wore their clothes in bright, gaudy colors, floral prints, mismatched, often used clothing. And of course, most importantly, they embraced music. Ground zero for this counterculture movement, and especially the music, was the Haight-Ashbury district in San Francisco. The neighborhood would become a haven for a number of the top psychedelic rock performance groups of all time, including groups like Jefferson Airplane, The Grateful Dead, and Janis Joplin, who all lived in the Haight-Ashbury district at one time or another. During the Summer of Love in 1967, psychedelic rock music was beginning to enter the mainstream and even received more and more commercial airplay, attracting a wide range of people. And this, in turn, actually caused a decline in the movement because the Haight-Ashbury district became so popular that overcrowding, homelessness, hunger, drug problems, and crime began to affect the neighborhood as it could not accommodate the rapid influx of people. Several things would ultimately lead to the demise of the hippie movement, one being the popularity the Haight-Ashbury district was so overcrowded that the people who provided services simply could not keep up. A second was that the whole hippie scene gradually became over-commercialized as even mainstream department stores started carrying hippie fashions and styles. And the third reason for the decline of the counterculture, specifically the hippie, was the arrival of hard drugs onto the scene, including heroin, cocaine, and methamphetamine, all of which were very physically addictive, as well as the declared illegality of drugs like marijuana and LSD, which were declared illegal by the federal government in 1968. The hippies in the counterculture had one final fling at the Woodstock Music Festival held near Bethel, New York in August of 1969. It turned into a free concert when more than 200,000 people showed up on the first day and there hadn't been enough money to build both fences and ticket booths or to build a stage. And the promoters chose to build the stage. By the third day of the concert, almost half a million people were present. The roads were blocked for seven miles and people just abandoned their cars to walk in and join the festival. During the festival, it had rained off and on, turning the site into a sea of mud. Because it had been estimated that less than 50,000 people would attend over the three days, there was most definitely not enough food or dry clothing available. But for four days, as technical problems stretched the concert into Monday morning instead of ending on Sunday as planned, a half a million hippies shared what they had, loved and took care of each other with the whole world watching. In fact, Woodstock was briefly the seventh largest city in the United States. <laughs>
and although the festival was remarkably peaceful given the number of people, there were two recorded fatalities. One from what was believed to be a heroin overdose, and another in an accident when a tractor ran over an attendee who was sleeping in a nearby hayfield. Of course, there were also two births recorded at the event, so the number of people who arrived equaled the number of people who left. The Woodstock Festival would come to symbolize the entire 1960s decade and the hippie philosophy to an entire generation. As far as a positive legacy, the hippie movement and the counterculture forced mainstream America to question existing values in society and begin to make changes. It was now okay to be different, to be an individual. You didn't have to fit in. Nonconformity was tolerated. And the hippies' back to basic philosophy inspired the environmental movement. Of course, there's also the rebirth of religious fundamentalism as a result of many burnt out hippies in the early 1970s seeking something different. But there was also a negative legacy of the hippies and the counterculture. The divorce rate doubled and there was an increase in STDs to epidemic proportions, including both herpes and the AIDS virus, which emerged at this time. Both were seen as a direct result of the sexual revolution, and drug experimentation led to a drug problem that still exists today. In fact, the 60s drug revolution resulted in the early deaths of some of the most prominent people of the 1960s, including Jim Morrison of The Doors, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, and even Brian Jones of The Rolling Stones. There was also a disillusionment amongst many of the hippies that led to political apathy into the 1970s and 1980s. And an attitude regarding the lack of responsibility also lasted well into the 1970s. But the drugs were definitely a significant issue. Dr. Timothy Leary was a Harvard philosophy professor who became synonymous with the drug revolution in the hippie counterculture. He ran experiments with lysergic acid diethylthermide, or commonly referred to as LSD, or acid, hoping to use it as a means of altering one's consciousness to reach a higher level of perception. Eventually, the Harvard administration ordered him to shut down his experiments, and he came to California, where he was able to first convince Stanford University to let him resume LSD testing, and then eventually founded the League of Spiritual Discovery, what was essentially a religion based upon the use of LSD. A popular saying associated with his League of Spiritual Discovery was, turn on, tune in, and drop out, as Dr. Leary urged American youth to reject values and rules of the old world and to build new societies based on experimentation. Now it is important to remember that when Dr. Leary is doing a lot of his research and even at the beginning of you know, selling and, and producing drugs, that many drugs like LSD um, and even marijuana was legal in the United States at the time, although this does change in 1968. And finally, you also have the beginning of the so-called sexual revolution, or at least the, what is seen as the most visible aspect. The United States had always been quite conservative when it came to attitudes about sex, especially as compared to much of Europe. That had certainly changed by the time of World War I, as many American servicemen away from home for the first time were greeted by French prostitutes when they arrived in France to assist with the war. Then yet yeah, was followed by the Roaring Twenties, where the use of alcohol, despite prohibition, fostered more liberated attitudes, especially among women, and it became perfectly acceptable for women to behave differently in public, smoking and drinking and even wearing clothing that was much more revealing. Margaret Sanger, in the 1920s, was one of America's earliest feminists, and during this time she even introduced the idea of birth control. And the United States acknowledged that servicemen may continue to have sex even if they were um, overseas during war, and actually gave condoms as part of the ration kits. <laughs> 
But perhaps one of the biggest influences on the sexual revolution was the introduction in 1961 of the birth control pill. And some say that the pill itself actually unleashed the sexual revolution because it took away the last remaining barrier against premarital sex for women by freeing them up to be as sexually active as their male counterparts without the fear of getting pregnant. This hint of sex or the suggestion of sex was even begun to be used for commercial purposes in this post-war era for all kinds of products. And many of the various groups that, that were involved in the counterculture used references to sex as part of their slogan. You know, if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. Environmentalists like the slogan, save water, shower with a friend. And anti-war activists use the phrase, make love, not war. In general, though, the whole idea was about rebelling against the establishment and challenging outdated standards. <laughs>